Hello, welcome back to our lessons in Genesis chapter 1, Lessons on Creation, entitled, In the Beginning. Now in our last lesson, we learned that God made the firmament, which we call the sky, or atmosphere. He then divided or separated the waters on the earth from the waters in the sky, and that's according to verses 6 and 7. God spent the whole second day making the sky with just the right amount of water so it would give the earth the moisture and humidity it needed for what he would create next. What did God do at the beginning of the third day? That's right, he gathered the waters together unto one place. Now, From what we know and from what we can observe in science, there are huge subterranean chambers or caverns under the crust of the earth where massive amounts of water is stored and trapped. That's where God put all the extra water that covered the earth so the dry land could appear. The water didn't disappear. God put it in the great deep below the crust of the earth, or below the ocean I mean, so it would help to keep the earth at the right temperature. Verse 10 says, And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. Now God has his good earth prepared for many new creations. As we begin today's lesson, let's find out what God is going to put on the dry land. Read verse 11 with me. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. So what was the first thing that God put on the dry land? That's right, grass. Now, did God have to wait a long time for the grass to grow? No, he didn't. And why not? Why didn't he have to wait? Because the all-powerful Creator let the earth bring forth grass and herbs and fruit trees, and it was so. It was because God said it that it happened like it did. God made sure the new rich soil which he had covered by water earlier, had all the chemical nutrients required for grass, without weeds, by the way, and we'll prove that later on. He also made beautiful fruit trees and lush vegetation. Did you know that evolution teaches that animals were on the earth before plants and trees? If that's true, what did the animals eat? According to evolution, they ate each other. Well, if that's true, why don't we see cows eating cows and horses eating horses? The reason we don't is it's because it's a lie. Cows eat grass and horses eat grass because God made the grass first so the animals would have grass to eat and not each other. God made the plants and the trees before he made the animals so that they would have food to eat. Just common sense, isn't it? How about reading verse 12 with me? Verse 12 says, And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Verse 12 tells us God made herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself. That's very important information. In order for herbs to yield or produce seed, they have to be mature plants. In order for fruit trees to yield or produce seed, they have to be mature also. God made 
all his creation fully mature and able to reproduce itself. Now evolution teaches that soil formed over millions of years by rocks from, meteor, from meteors that crashed on the earth. These rocks rubbing against each other and weathering eventually broke up to form sand. This sand then somehow mixed with water and the right nutrients or elements to become soil. So God said it and did it. Evolution says it took millions of years. You know, it takes a lot of faith to believe in evolution because there's no observable scientific proof for what they say. On the other hand, we can look at nature as it operates today and see that it fits exactly with what God tells us in Genesis chapter 1. When God looked at everything he made on the third day, he said that it was what? That's right, he said that it was good. Now how about reading verses 14 and 15 with me? And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and it was so. God began the fourth day by saying, let there be lights in the firmament. Now up to this point, there was only one light to provide illumination on the earth. What was that light called, do you remember? It was called the glory of God. So God was replacing the light of his glory with lights he was making for the benefit of the plants, animals, and people. And as we see in our text, the first purpose for the lights was to divide or distinguish daytime from nighttime. God also made the lights so people could use them to tell time and to know when the different seasons were coming. By the way, which season are we in right now? That's right, spring. And how can we tell that from the lights? Daylight is longer, which helps the weather to get warmer. The longer daylight and the heat it generates also helps the plants and trees to grow leaves and fruit. Again, all you have to do is look around. Look at what is visible to you, and you can see how God made things. Now, if you would, read verses 16 through 18 with me. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. Verse 16 says that God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. Also says he made stars also. So, what's the greater light called? Any idea? It should be very obvious. The greater light is the sun. So then, what's the lesser light called? That's right, the moon. Now, God also says in this verse that he made stars at the same time that he made the sun and the moon. People can use the stars at night to know if they're going north, south, east, or west, by looking at the constellations. So when did God make the stars? On the fourth day. Evolution teaches that the stars evolved billions of years ago, and as they collided with each other, meteors were crashing all over the place, including on the earth. 
One of those crashes was a Mars-sized object that reliquified the Earth and blasted enough matter into the Earth's orbit to form the Moon. Wow! I must say, evolutionists have a very vivid imagination. How they come up with these amazing stories without any observable scientific evidence is incredible. But more importantly, it's very deceitful and dishonest. But because God knows everything, He knew that people would try another way to explain how the universe and the earth began. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, God had this to say to evolutionists, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God tells us that the creation can be clearly seen and can be understood by the things that are made. Evolutionists reach way, way back in the cosmos, way, way back supposedly billions of years ago, and come up with these fanciful guesses as to how these materials somehow came together to form the Big Bang, and then from there, they postulate all these different scenarios, all based on things that they can't see. But God tells us in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20 that the creation of the world can be clearly seen and it can be clearly understood by the things that are made. All we have to do is look at what God has already made and the processes that He's already put in place and work back from that rather than invent something billions of years ago and try to bring that into our time today because it simply doesn't work. And God goes on to say that people who do this, who make up all these things, who make up a Mars-sized object that reliquified the Earth and blasted enough matter into the Earth's orbit, orbit to form the Moon. So those people are without excuse. So now let's get back to reality. When God looked at everything He made on the fourth day, He said that it was, that's right, good. Now, as God starts the fifth day of creation, He already made everything that His next creations would need during the first four days. In verse 20, God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So on day five, God made the fish and the creatures that move in the water and the birds or the fowl that fly in the sky. Now notice something in verse 20 with me. God called the sky in this verse the open firmament rather than the firmament like he's done in the past. Why did he do that? God is telling us where the birds can fly in the sky or atmosphere and He gives us a fine detail to prove that He's the Creator. Okay, science buffs, what are the two closest layers of the atmosphere called? They're called the troposphere and the stratosphere. Birds fly in the open firmament or troposphere. You know, when we look at the sky, we often fail to realize just how big and how high it is. 
the sky or atmosphere extends 330,000 feet or 62.5 miles above the earth and has five layers. Birds can't fly in all five of those layers, nor can it fly 62 miles above the earth. Birds fly in the open firmament or the troposphere, the first layer of the atmosphere. Now read verse 21 with me, if you would. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. God says something very important in verse 21. The creatures God made were made after their kind. That means they were created according to their types. For example, there are many kinds of dogs, but they're all dogs. There are many types of birds, but they're all birds. Dogs don't turn into elephants, even though they both have four legs and a tail. Butterflies don't turn into birds, even though they both have wings. God made every creature after his kind or type. That's what the evidence in nature shows us. All we have to do is look around to see that things are just as God says they are. Evolution wants us to believe that animals came from a blob of protoplasm that happened to come together in response to electrical discharges over a primeval ocean millions of years ago. Here's a question. How do they know this? Were they there? No, they weren't. Was God there in the beginning? Yes, he was. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So, should we believe scientists who are making things up? Or should we believe God who was there and actually made everything? The answer is obvious, isn't it? We can see the evidence of God's creation all around us. Now, after God made all the birds and the creatures in the waters, he did something new in verse 22. Did you catch that rhyme? New in verse 22? Anyway, read verse 22 with me. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the fowl multiply in the earth. Why did God bless the animals, but he didn't bless the grass or the herbs and the trees? Why did God do that? It's because the animals have life, according to verse 20. And let's look at verse 20 again. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. So God blessed the animals because they have life, according to verse 20. And they were created as living creatures, according to verse 21. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth. And there's much more that we could say that differentiates the living creatures from the plants. But we'll talk more about the living creatures and God's blessings in our next lesson. Now, God was pleased with what he made on the fifth day. And he said that, that's right, that it was good. Until next time, I hope you'll invite some friends to watch the videos and be ready to answer their questions. Until then, may God bless you and we'll see you next time.